How y'all doing? Welcome to Train Up a Parent. <laughs> You're so good to me. You get so great. I love this. Remember, we parent today for what we want in the future. And as I said last week, uh, same thing for this week. There's many things that we're doing today to sow into the seeds of what we want to experience in our future. What do we want our adult children to look like has so much to do with the three virtues that we'll go over tonight. So we're going to do three virtues tonight. Uh, virtue number four is justice. Justice. Now, uh, remember, virtues make up what character is and what your child is. Justice is this, the respect of the rights of other people. Really, basically, just the golden rule. It's teaching our children that other people are important. That, once again, the world does not revolve around you. Because if, you're, if the world revolves around your children, then when they become adults, life is going to crash on them because it stops happening that way. But instead... Life is about others. And when you live a life that's about giving and, and doing for other people, that's a happy life. A life that's about taking and about me and what I can get, right? Even you see that in a three-year-old or four-year-old throwing a tantrum. That's not a happy life, right? No matter how much they take, there's never going to be any happiness. It's when our children are taught to give. And once again, we demonstrate to our children. Of course, we're going to speak it. We're going to expect it, right? And we're going to train them to it. But really what they see us do is going to be the ultimate guide for this. I think one of the greatest things you can teach your kids is when they walk into a situation or a room or any kind of like, um, I don't know, event or activity, it's what do I bring to the situation rather than what can I take away and get from the situation. And, and you know, obviously there's amazing things that we get out of every interaction with people and, and when we go to school and when we're in church, but... The difference is, is your focus. So when you walk into the room and you're entering into a group of people and you're saying to yourself, you're walking in with bold and confidence and you're thinking to yourself, what can I give? What can I give when I walk into this, this interaction? Or what do I bring when I walk into the room? There's so much, it's just a better out, it's just a different perspective on a same, it's just a different perspective than what, can I get from it? What am I going to, what's my, um, what am I going to receive? What am I going to take away from this interaction? And you know, we're flesh, so we're going to be let down. People are going to let us down. But if you're looking at what you bring into a situation, you're rarely let down. Rare. Matter of fact, you walk in and you're kind of like, how can I add to this? What strengths are inside of me? What do I have? What gifts are inside of me that I can bring into this situation that's going to bless the people that are in this room? You'll never be let down. But if you're looking for how can I, what can I get, what can I receive, what's my takeaway, you can, you can guarantee on some occasions you're going to walk away empty-handed and feeling like you were robbed. Amen, amen. So we're looking for, as we go out of the world, it's very important that we become aware and we're looking. It's not about always my, it's about how other people experience our family, how they experience us. Right? And I'm amazed to go out into the world and see how many annoying, rude people that there are that don't care about anybody else's experience. Meaning this, it starts at zero. If you're in a restaurant and your baby starts crying, you simply get up and leave the restaurant. I mean, you can try a little bit, and if it's not going to work, then you leave the restaurant. Why? Because you go outside, wait till you get it all ready, because there's other people there enjoying the restaurant. And hearing your baby cry, though you may have a right, just because you have a right to do something doesn't mean it's the right thing to do. Right? And I don't want to spoil other people's... You're in a, in a movie. I've been in movie theaters with her and somebody brought a baby and it's screaming in the movie. Well, I have a right to be here. Right? I, you bought your ticket. I get that. But it's not the right thing to do to spoil the rest of our movies and our experience. That's a selfish attitude. And so we have to make sure that for our families that we exhibit and we show in our children what looks right. Right? I get on an airplane. You ever get behind the kid that's kicking your seat? And you're like, what is the parent even doing? Right? What are you even doing? Right? Some kid, I, I thought it was on a rocket, like he's just shaking the, the chair. You're like, what, what? But parents don't care, right? They're in their own world, and well, what do you do? It's a four year old, right? It's a three year old. No, I know what you do, right? You do train up a parent because that's not how we do children. My children can get on a plane at any age, and especially when they're like two, right? We're on it. Like, it's not a relaxing uh, flight, at least no. not for Holly. I actually no. relax pretty well. For Holly, it's, it's a relaxing. lot of work. It is. It was. We took all of this year. And she's great and amazing. But she it's still a two year old for five and a half hours on an airplane is work. But you do work 
so other people can enjoy their flight because we care about other people. Well, I think it's important that we understand <clears throat> your right no longer, how do I say this? Our right should never infringe on someone else's right to enjoy the same situation. That's so good. And when it does, you need to go back and say to yourself, hold on, it's no longer, it's no longer my right. And so for us, when we were in the restaurant, yes, I have a right to be there enjoying a meal. But when my kids, and, and they're making, you know, crazy, <laughs> they're frustrated and they're hungry or whatever, they, you know, they're too young to be in a restaurant at this point, and they start infringing on someone else's romantic dinner or, you know, they can't even talk to each other because my child is crying. Well, now my right is infringing on their right to enjoy their dinner out. And that's where it's just common courtesy. It's just kind. It's being others conscious to say, eh, maybe we just need to wait until we're at a different age to be able to be at the restaurant. And like Pastor Scott said on the airplane, right down to, you know, have you ever been in the seat where someone's got a tray and they want to take a nap, but they just keep like, and they keep yeah, laying on the this. tray and it's just bouncing you up and down. And you're like, okay, how do you not know someone is sitting on the other side of that tray that's connected to my seat? And I, it's just a reality, but I have a right to have, you know, I don't know, huff and puff on the tray, but you don't because it's now infringing on someone else's right to enjoy their flight that they too paid for. There's so, so many people who just don't care about people and that's right. not who we are. You got the person on the plane who's watching this movie without headphones on so everybody around can hear him. It's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Like it's so aggravating to me yeah. that you, you literally don't care about anyone else in the world but yourself. You got your kid also playing a video game at full blast. Ding, 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 pew, 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 for four and a half hours. Right? The, really? This is, this is not what we do. We care about other people. I'm in Hobby Lobby last week. Don't ask me why. I'm in Hobby Lobby, and there's like five kids like this tall playing hide-and-go-seek running through the store. What are we doing? Right? That's not what we do in a store. That's not how we allow our kids to act in a store. Right? And so we got to make sure that we care about, right? So we were, uh, my thing is, is uh, we're driving down the road. I have all the kids in there. They're all pretty young. And uh, you know how the lane ends in Arizona all the time, right? It goes from one, two lanes down to one lane. You have two miles to figure it out, right? You, you know how that is. You, every, and everybody who is going to heaven and loves Jesus, they get over right away. You know how those people are. But then you have the people that maybe they burn in hell. I don't know. But they're the ones, you know the ones that they'll go all the way down and then they want people to let them in? Those evil people, right? You know who I'm talking about, right? So here we are, we're in the line, and you got the people blowing on, and I have a rule. It's my, I live by it. I'm not saying it's biblical. It's my rule. I let one in. That's my rule. I'll be kind to one, right? I'll give one. I will never give two. That's my rule. So one got it. One came up. I was annoyed at it. I said, get in there, right? Enjoy living with Baba Church, right? I love my church. Get in there. But then this guy wanted to get in also. And I looked over, and he's all, and I went, no, right? And I was not. I'm like, no. And then he's all, right? And I said, no. And then he rolled down his window, and then he's screaming something, and I'm just like, never, right? And now I said, I go, I'll never let you in, ever, right? And I told my whole family, I said, here's the thing, family, I will never let him in. I will put this car into the back of the car in front of me, right? I will crash into them. If meant going to heaven, letting him in, I would burn in hell for the rest of my life before I ever let him in. That's how determined I was at this point. And he's getting closer, and then I'm whipping it closer, like we're, we're dancing here, and we're dancing. But, and then finally he gives up, and he gets behind me, and I felt so good. And then Baylor from the back goes, I think dad just lost a marble. And I went, hey! <laughs> no. Those are good moments to, you know, to Say. train your kids. When, when, you know, I'm listening to you talk about the Hobby Lobby, and, and um, I don't know, do you do the cart one right now? Which one? Just putting the cart back. Yeah, well, yeah, we'll talk about that right now. Yeah, you can go into that. Um, I was talk about that. You know, when, when your kids are little, like, this is great opportunity for the wise. This is a great opportunity to train them in the wise and to explain to them. Um, so, you know... There's people out there that clean up the trays at McDonald's, and there's people out there that have to come in. You know, there's all different, there's all different jobs out there, and your little guys, they don't necessarily know that. So it was really big for me when the kids were little to put my cart back. Like, I was really big on, there's somebody, like, 
they have to go out and gather all the carts. And we live in Arizona, so it's really, really hot. Imagine if everyone just took their cart back. And now, I mean, like every store you go to, they have like the cart, I don't know, what do they call it? The cart holders? Yeah, the cart stall. <laughs> Cart stall. There you go. And there's so many of them in a parking lot. And and so I would tell the kids, let's go put the cart back. Because there's someone that has to go out and gather all of those carts. Now, yeah, that's the person's job. And sure, they can go gather all the carts. But do they have to? And so it's just training our kids at a young age to be aware that other people are out there. And we have this potential to help make life a tiny bit easier for people. Come on. I can clean up after myself at McDonald's. Like, sure, they have someone that can, mm -hmm. but should they have to? Like, I'm a grown person. I can get my tray. I mean, they have trash cans on the way out the door. Clean up your stuff and throw it away. And so I would tell the kids, well, we got to do, you know, let's help these guys out. We should be cleaning up after ourselves. It's just teaching our kids to be clean anyway. But on top of that, there's this amazing opportunity for us to tell our kids the why and to direct them to the fact that in a roundabout way, you're loving on people. You're telling, you're telling your kids, people matter to me and I want them to matter to you. And then it transitions, like we were saying in like, I think the very first the very first day of, of train up a parent, people matter. And we have an opportunity to train in our kids that we can be aware of them, and when we give them the why, that transition can go from situation to situation without us having to keep you know, explaining it. Do you see how the little things we do as parents plant seeds that are going to produce what we want? Something little, taking the cart back, right? That's little, but you're loving somebody and doing going beyond, as the Bible says, if somebody asks you to go one mile, two miles, right? Holly's been big, and it's engraved in me now um, that when we go to any restaurant, especially fast food, Anderson's leave the table cleaner than when we showed up. Yep. And to watch my kids now, they just pick it all, all right, there we go, they let it, right? And they just clean it up. I know, and when they joke, they're like, Mom, there's a guy, somebody gets, we're taking his job away, Mom. You know, he's going to have nothing to do now, and he's going to get fired. It's like, no, right? And we, But that's even if we go to a, a restaurant, you know, out back with the servers. Everybody kind of, we, not, we're not back in the kitchen doing the dishes. That's what I'm saying. Like we stack up the, the plates, yeah. and we all kind of tidy things up to make it simple and to make it easy. When we rent a house, for the love of all that's good and holy, my wife, we have our last day's clean day. That's just what we do on the last day. And I'm like, honey, I paid for a cleaning like I paid. And she's like, that's all right. They won't have anything to do. I'm like, good for us. And so we teach our children. We do. But it's showing, once again, what love is. And we leave that house cleaner than when we showed up. I'm talking doing the toilets, the kids. Like, we just, we just make that house dance. Well, right? And, you know, as a parent, sometimes it's like, why? That's so much work. You don't realize how the little things like those are making such an impact on their hearts when they become grown-ups. Once again, people matter. And for the Andersons, you always hear that. And I think you, you, we talk about the family identity. Use your, you know, whatever your last yep. name. We always say, this is what the Andersons do. Andersons don't, yep. well, they, nobody else cleans up the table. That's all right. I don't care. Right? Once again, but the Andersons, we clean up. The Andersons care about people. The Andersons clean our rental. This is what the Andersons do. And so it's a, we do things differently than the rest of the people out there. And we have to realize it's not about the possession, it's about the person. Everything's about the person. I remember walking with one of my kids, and there's an old dirty field, and they, they threw something. I don't remember what it was, right on the ground. And I'm like, Pick, what are you doing? Pick that up. What are we doing? He's like, Dad, look at it. It's a dump. Like, and there was. There's like mattresses and junk. And I said, it doesn't matter. Somebody's going to have to pick up what you did also, Right? So why are we giving somebody else a job or something to do? We just hold on to it, throw it in a garbage can, right? Because once again, other people's stuff does matter. A child borrows some kid's bike, but it's an old beat-up bike and something breaks on it. Well, we teach our child, well, they're like, Dad, it's, 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 it's a piece, pile of junk. It doesn't matter. It's not about the bike. It's about the person who has the possession. We care about the people and the possession because if it's important to somebody, then it has to be important to us. I remember I was outside working, and uh, Peyton was what, maybe three or four. He was outside. He had this Batman, right, his little Batman. And his Batman had been through a lot, right? The dog got a hold of it. It had like a stumpy arm on it. Part of a face was gone from the dog. Its cape was half off. I mean, he was beat. And he's like, Dad, I've got to go in. And I'm going to get a drink. Can you hold my Batman? And I was, I was, I'm like, sure. And she handed me a Batman, and I went, boop, and I just threw it in the toolbox. And I, when I looked over his face, you'd have thought that I, I slapped his best friend. Like, and I went, oh, no, no, whoops, I dropped him. And I picked him up, 
I'm like, okay, I'm watching Batman. So he went in the house and I made Batman. I had some stuff, made like a little foam, little mattress, made a little bed. And when he came out, he was so happy of how I treated his Batman. Once again, it looked like it had no value, but the person has value. And because it's valuable to them, it then becomes valuable, important to me. We make sure that we treat everybody with kindness and their stuff with kindness and respect. Well, and that leads to legacy, too. So, you know, it's so funny because you don't even realize when you teach your kids this and then you watch them become parents. I've watched Lakin direct Olive to to go around someone's yard and to go up a walkway. Now, they could have cut across the grass. You know, it Mm. probably wouldn't have been a problem with the person. But in the back of my mind, I thought to myself, hmm, I wonder if that's because we've always tried to train our kids. Let's not walk through someone's front yard. You know, I don't care if it is just rocks. Let's try not to like do that. Let's go ahead and honor that they've got a walkway and let's go to the front of their home and let's go down the walkway. And it's so affirming to see my grown adult son now inadvertently teaching his daughter, oh, no, let's go this way. He doesn't even have to, I mean, it's, it's just in their heart. Who knows? I don't know if that's why he did it. But in your mind, in my mind, I'm like, okay, maybe it was though. And it's a very cool thing to watch your kid give that respect and that honor to that homeowner simply by just having their little person just let's go down the, the walkway. Let's not cr- cut across their yard. And, you know, people people have to mow their yard and they they put flowers in their yard. So it's a really affirming thing to teach our kids to honor people by honoring those things that matter to those people. People are important. Authority is a very big part of justice. That we are different as train up a parent that we train our children that we honor, which means I give value to authority, that teachers have value, right? People in the world, police officers, right? Right? Firemen, all these people are valuable to us. We treat them with respect. You get pulled over for a ticket, right? We don't talk about how horrible, we don't make a scene with them because I want my children then one day, they, I want them to honor me. So the example that they see with authority is the example that I'll get. So I'm kind, I'm polite, they're just doing their job anyway, right? Why am I all upset and mad? Instead, I exhibit what I want them to have in their own life, that things are important, that the national anthem is important. Because why? Because people die so that we can be here in America and do that. And it's important to other people that I stand at attention for the, for the, when we sing the song, right? All of these things, the flag is important in America. These are authorities, and I'm not talking politics here. I'm talking Bible here. It's just biblical stuff that we do, that we give value to the authorities out there. If I want my child to value my authority, then I have to make sure that I'm training them the importance of honoring. Well, Pat, you know, yeah, my kid, just the, the teacher called and they're disrupted. But, you know, the class is boring. Okay. So if you're bored, you're allowed to be disrespectful. Is that how we do things? No, 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 because they're going to have boring conversations with their wife one day, right? They have to learn, right? There's going to be boring things their whole, as a, once again, no, I'm telling you that people are important, that you're going to have, you're going to be time that you're bored on your job. It doesn't mean that you get to act up, but we train our children that even when you are bored, which you know it's a lie anyway, it's, cl- it's math, it's supposed to be boring. What do you, I don't even understand what you're saying there. Of course it's, it's boring, right? But instead we teach our children that, you know, well, my teacher is a jerk and your children will have jerks for teachers. But here's the thing. They're going to have jerks for boss. And if they don't learn how to love and be kind and honor jerks that are teachers when they're young, then they're going to be the ones that can't keep a job, can't hold a job. They're the ones that go from thing to thing because we didn't train them when they were young. But yeah, there's all different types of personalities. There's nice teachers. There's bad teachers. There's jerks that teach. There's bad bosses. There's nice bosses. There's coworkers. Like, these are the people that you learn as a child to deal with so that when you're an adult, you're able to navigate and handle it in the way that we want. And one of the biggest keys, moms of little ones, young ones, learn now. This is the greatest tool that the Word gives us, and that is the power of prayer. And I remember um, it was Heath, actually, had a teacher, and I'd never had a personality conflict. I've, I'd never had a kid that had a personality conflict with a teacher until this moment. And I think he was about second grade. It was. And I was so frustrated. I was just, my poor kid, like, I had a problem, too. Because she like, was feels above. Yeah, well... I believe it. I believe it was the devil. That's to be determined. But um, I just, I thought, what in the world? And in that very year, I was like, this, I'll never walk through this again. Because I'm not the type, um, I actually will dig my heels in even more. So rather than pull my kid out, I just will become your assistant. 
And I, yeah. I will I will be in the class every day if I have to to make yes. sure that everybody plays nice, teacher, child. Then we're gonna get all we're all gonna I'm gonna get my way somehow. So, um, but what I realized that year is I hadn't employed the power of prayer. And so when I give someone authority over my kids, I expect my children, as we're teaching, I expect my children to respect that authority. And so for me, it was very, very eye-opening. And so from that year on, before school ever even got into session, I had already prayed. I had prayed in, every, I had just gone, I'd gone to, I'd gone to God and I'd said, I want the best teachers for my kids this year. And I trust the power of the word. I trust that you know that Holy Spirit knows the best person for my kid. And I'm so excited that they're going to have the greatest year. But I would do that in the summer before school started. And then if they had any issues, well, we're just going to deal with those issues and you're going to have to suck it up and be okay and conflict resolution and learn how to deal with people that maybe aren't always on your side. Um, so really start now employing the power of prayer. And even if your kids aren't young, but still in school, start praying in the summer for their year coming up. Pray, pray the teacher in that you want. You hear that there's an amazing teacher or there's an amazing teacher you want your kid to have, declare it. Thank God that that's going to be your kid's teacher. But then back that teacher up. Amen, amen. So referees, sporting events. It is crazy how parents can get at the sporting events. What? They're not playing for money. They're not playing for anything. And you're acting like this is the, you know, the, the Super Bowl of everything. In, in, in reality, your kids are taking notes and they're learning. The referee is the authority. Once again, I put myself in the place. When I, I stepped into refing uh, for our church league that we had at one point, and come to find out, I'm like, that's a hard job. You're not going to get the calls right all the time. You can't see everything. Everyone's going to be mad at you, even if you do a right call. Right? And then you begin to go, oh my gosh, these refs are just out here doing their job, doing the best they can. And so we as parents, we teach our children to be respectful to the referee. Well, that, that wasn't a strike. Yeah, it was, because that's what they called it. Whatever they called it is what it is. It, it could have been this high. It didn't matter. So we teach our children, right, to lose gracefully, right? I, I would rather have a child, child, let me say it this way, a child will learn more through a graceful loss than they ever will from a win where it was all this mess with a referee. I don't like that. I'd rather my kid lost. And so we want to make sure for our household, for our kids, for ourselves, we're not the dad screaming at the ref. Like there's times I'm like, mm, right? And I just go, okay, I'm showing, I'm, right? I'm showing something different. I'm being a train-up a parent, even though the, the ref's not as smart as he thinks he is, and that's all right. Because once again, what I do today has a big impact on how they deal with authority in the future. And we have to make sure that this game does not mean as much as the child of my character. And dads, I'm really talking to a lot of you out there. Well, no, there's crazy moms out there. I've seen, some, some, I've seen a whole lot of crazy out there. But not, you, definitely not. No, you don't care. You're like, oh my God, he got pinned. It's so cute. Right? And you're like, well, it wasn't good. Well, that's not entirely true. I do get very frustrated. I am the. You get frustrated at uh, mean moms when one mom was next to you and she's, hurt him. And you're like, are you kidding me? Yeah, I don't like that. I, yeah, hurt no, him? I don't. That's, that's what came out of your mouth, yeah, right? And then we're my like, kid. kill him. No, I'm just teasing. So. I did. <laughs> All right, kid number, sucks. I'm virtue number five is integrity. <laughs> Our word matters. Our word has to matter. What we say matters. They're watching. Our kid's word matters. If you said you'll do it, you do it. If you sign them up for a soccer, right, and halfway through the season, they're like, I don't want to play soccer. And parents go, all right, we're out. That's easier. No, no, no. Because a team is counting on you. Even if you don't even play, it doesn't matter. We gave our word. And Andersons are people that we keep our word. You don't have to play next season. That's fine. But you are going to finish out this season because we signed you up. Right? And so it's very important for our kids that our word matters. When I say I'm going to be somewhere on time, we're there on time. Andersons are on time. Because people matter. People are waiting for us. Right? They're, right? Well, we're just five minutes. No, no, no. We, what we do, where we go, the Andersons, it's very important. No, no, I know things happen and the kids understand that. But 99% of the time that our word matters. And to parents out there, make sure that you just don't throw words out there. Things that, that may or may not happen. Hey, in the spring, we're going to go camp. It's going to be fun. Zing, zing, zing. Kids log that in. Spring came and gone. You were busy. You didn't go camping. Well, why'd you say it? Don't say it. 
right? Just say, hey, you know, maybe in the spring, maybe we'll be able to put something together, do something. But you don't have to give a definite where your word has to be broken. It'd be better to say nothing at all. Spring comes and you go, hey, let's go camping next week. And everybody's just as excited and you didn't have to break anybody's heart with lack of your word, making sure that your words matter. Uh, you're teaching your kids the same thing. That uh, a kid has, a, uh, you know, gets asked a homecoming, right? And then the cute guy that she wanted to get asked asked her homecoming, and she's like, "Well, I don't. I'm just going to tell this guy I can't go." No, that's not what we do. That's not Ander- Andersons. Don't do that, right? No, no. You you go with this one. This is what we do. You said yes, so that we're going to go with this date. This is how we do things. That we make sure that we we raise our children and all of those events that are going to happen with integrity in their life. If you said it then we're going to do it. Uh, Number six, virtue number six is fortitude. Fortitude. This is, if you're going to have successful kids, this is a big, uh, very important one. It's your ability to deal with problems. It's your AQ, adversity quotient. You know that your IQ means nothing. It really doesn't. You look at the most successful people in the world, IQ had nothing to do with it. It was their AQ, their ability to deal with problems. And we have to really have a mindset as we're raising our children that we're helping them and training them to be able to uh, overcome problems in their life because life is about problems. The most successful people in the world are the ones that can overcome the biggest problems. So we have to make sure, right, they're going to have problems in their marriage one day, right? Well, how do I overcome that? I learned things in the third grade, in the sixth grade, in the seventh grade that my parents put in my heart that I've learned how to overcome problems. They're going to have problems maybe with a the kid. They're going to have problems in their job. They're going to have, life is going to have problems. We have to make sure that we don't take away their problems, that we're always solving their problems. You see this a lot with the parents out there where they just solve all their kids' problems. They have no problems. Took all the problems away. There we go. Great life. And then they become adults and life hits them in the face. Because yeah. Life's got a whole lot of problems and they don't know how to deal with it. And all of a sudden, nobody's taken away their problems in their life. And so they can't keep a job. They can't keep a relationship. Nothing seems to be working because they weren't taught how to re- do problems. All right, give me five minutes. We're going to close with this. Give you 10 things real quickly. Uh, the key part of success, I said that. Number one, don't take away their problems. Number two, uh, problem solving skills. I develop problem solving skills. I believe in teaching your children to do like chess. I think chess is very good because it teaches them how to think ahead, two, three moves ahead, to be able to solve problems, have them do Sudoku, different things, right? Just begin to introduce these things to help them work on and overcome problems. Number three, freedom to fail. They have to be able to fail. Don't take away all the problems. I would rather a child fail then succeed oftentimes because successful people are the ones who are not afraid to fail. Failure is always on the avenue or at least on the path of success. And so we have to make sure that we give our children the opportunity to fail, right? Well, I don't know. Like I'm embarrassed when they play baseball. So it'd be better if we just took them out of it. No, 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 right? I love it. If they're the worst kid on the team, good for that. That's great. Why? Because in that, I can teach them how to practice. I can teach them how to get better and see their skills rise week after week after week. And so I can show them how to overcome a problem. Number four, uh, see the positive. That even when they do fail, they have to be able to see the positive in it. Right? Because if failure means I'm a failure, that's not true. You just, yeah, everybody fails. Right? It's not a big deal. So the good thing in this is let's look at what you learned in this failure. Right? This didn't go your way. So what did you learn? What can you, what's your takeaway from this? What aren't you going to do next time? Making sure that we're training our children to that. Number five, uh, reassure them with your love, of course. And number six is be there. The two of those kind of go together. That I'm, with, I'm there. Right? I'm available. When you go through a failure, they're able to come and talk to you. And here's a big one. You know, we all live in three different worlds. We have our public world, we have our private world, and then we have our hidden world, right? All three worlds. Public, everybody can see what's going on. My private world is kind of like here, it's kind of close, right? Family members, close friends can kind of, I kind of talk about. But then we all have this hidden world. And in the hidden world, nobody gets in here without an invitation. Nobody gets in there. And when, if you can cultivate a relationship with your children through trust, where they'll let you into the hidden world, there's nothing greater in that. Right? When they're going through right, a time, and you have to learn to look for these windows of opportunity. They're small, and you don't want to miss them. You got a kid who's just hanging around you, and you're like, what are you doing? And they're like, oh, I don't know. Just kind of. And you're like, well, go do something. I don't know. Why, why are you bugging me? Right? Not realizing that the kid, right, at those moments, I'm like, hey, let's go. Let's go to, you want to go to Dairy Queen? Let's go to Dairy Queen. You get in the car, and you start driving, and all of a sudden the kid says, hey, you know, I'm dealing with blah, blah, and it just comes out. And, I, and you're like, oh my gosh, that was beautiful. Yeah. And I can get in there, but I have to be careful because they let me in and I want to be invited back. 
So I can't get in there and I can't, right? You know, your daughter's like, oh my God, this guy. And, right? and you're like, wow, you're too young to date. And you're too, right? And you start rearranging everything. She goes, oh, love you, Dad. I just know I can't let you back in here because it's a little painful. So you got to learn how to steer and navigate in the midst of that, right? Hey, I have trouble talking to girls, Dad. And so what do I do with that? And so I'm like, okay. And so then here's, here's the things you do. And that takes us to the next one. I begin to, uh, um, oh, I'm sorry, uh, be there for them. No, it'll be the, uh, number eight. Number seven is share your failures. So in that moment, you know, when your kid's gone through a failure and they're letting you into their world, share failures. It's good that your kids realize that we all fail. I think when we do fail, we always think we're the only ones that fail. No one else deals with it. But then they hear all of the failures dad had dating. They're like, oh my gosh, my life is good. Right? There's love. <laughs> oh my God. You have, how, many, how many girls broke up with you? All of them, except for one. Everyone. <laughs> so you share your... Yes, she's still here. She's done broke up with me. And uh, so share your failures. Number eight, uh, teach, practice, hard work, and wisdom. Right? So a failure, okay, so you try and navigate them too. All right, well, you know, get a book. Books have answers, right? Well, I can't talk to girls. All right, let's get you a book. We order one together. Wisdom is always available. I want them to know as adult, if they have trouble in their marriage or trouble with their kids, like you all are here in Train Up a Parent, not that you have trouble, but you, you're learning, you're getting wisdom on how to be better as parents. So I want them to know that when they have a problem, that there is wisdom out there to get. And that if you work hard and practice things, right, if you'll give your best at it, then it cuts down the likelihood that you would fail again. Do you have your hand there? Is that... I do, but I want to do it at the end. Okay. Number, so you, okay. Number nine, never give up. Andersons don't give up. That's what we do. We just keep trying, trying, keep going and going. And number 10 is we teach our children not to be stressed and worried. It's very important that you help navigate your children's inward world that we don't, Andersons don't carry stress and worry, right? I don't want to raise up kids who are stressed and worried. And so we really work hard of giving them the tools on the inside of them of navigating their thoughts and navigating their attitude and tell them, it's not a big deal. Like savvy, like if you have to get up and sing in front of everybody in the church, come on, baby, it's going to be fine. If you mess up, who cares, right? You're speaking to them. You're talking them through so that they can do bigger things in their life. I think a really huge part of the AQ is knowing their source. And I think that this, this is paramount to their life and to being having a high AQ, adversity quotient. And that is knowing that they have access to the throne room. They have access to God's word. They have access to wisdom. So never, ever, ever let your kids, no matter how young or how old they get, always be there to encourage them that God cares and that he's listening and that he, they have his favor, they have that unmerited grace on their life, and that in any given situation, they really do have all they need with him and that he will guide and he will help them and that we're but representations of, of the bigger who he is and we can direct them to God's word. It's such a powerful, it's such a powerful place to be when you can remind your kids they were made in the image and likeness of, of God. That He placed inside of them an amazing equipping for the talent, for the things that they're walking out in their life. Reminding them that they have grace for those mean friends at school, and that they can go far further than we ever did. We we wanted our children to know that we that they've got way more inside of them than they could possibly even imagine. And, and to this day, when I see them accomplish things that are far greater than I ever did at their age, I just, God gets all the glory. And I love telling my kids how much God loves them. Don't ever, ever, ever allow yourself to live a day without reminding them of the power of God's word and that they're never too young to employ that over what they're walking through, ever. Amen. They can do all things through Christ Jesus that strengthens them. Yep. And if you learned anything at all, give the Lord a big hand clap. Come on, somebody. Yeah.